I'm delighted to welcome you to the third meeting of the International Research Collaboration. This global meeting assembled the world leaders in the expanding field of research and development in open dialogue. We are acutely aware of the growing crisis associated with mental health, heavily impacted by the pandemic. As we will learn during this event, open dialogue has been recently identified as a best practice and human rights aligned approach to mental health. Thus, it is timely that this meeting will enable us to meet and discuss critical issues about developing, assessing, and delivering open dialogue. This conference is intended as a celebration of the open dialogue community and, and research, and research as a tool to monitor and develop our own practice. For the first time, this conference has adopted a peer review process to assess the abstract we have received, set the agenda and give feedback to each other to develop our research. This peer review, including the definition of criteria, involved researchers at different stages of their career, PhD student and professor, and peer expert and family members. In line with the horizontal approach of open dialogue, we have removed all the titles from this program. We are all experts here, and we acknowledge the different sources of our wisdom. By sharing our experience and learning from each other, we will be able to respond more effectively to, implement to the implementation challenges that we are dealing with. And implementation will be one of the major um, uh, topic of this event. Other conference topics are adherence and fidelity, uh, case and outcome studies, theoretical aspect, and personal account. For Open Dialogue, the project that I'm coordinating, today's conference is an important milestone. We have spent the last two years learning more about our community, meeting the wonderful people who make, uh, who make up our community. More than 300 persons here are here attending this conference, and I think this shows the progress that we are doing. It's also a milestone because we are going to present in the next days the result of the international survey, which involved 136 teams around the world. And you can already find in the, um, in, in the on-demand content more information about the protocol we have developed. So, for this special event of this conference, we have also developed a special map that you can see and uh, use to explore the result of, uh, of the survey and will deliver tomorrow. And now let me thank the people and uh, the people who have organized this event with us and the organization that are making this event possible. Our sponsor, Open Excellence, to whom I will gladly give the floor in a moment. Mark Offenbeck, who is co-chair of this event and also organized the two previous editions of this conference. The organizing committee, 20 high motivating people from all over the world, and in particular, Cindy, Ro, and Martine, have been working for months to promote participation and organize the workshop in this event. Our chat moderators and chair will generously lend their dialogical skills in, the, in service of this conference. Our keynote speakers will illuminate us on different aspects of open dialogue, from the origin to date and the research in Western Lapland, to the new World Health Organization guideline, the Odessi study, the role of peers in their study, the new frontiers from open dialogue, in working with refugees women, the role that the use of neuroleptic may have for outcome. And we will also present the collective book about the open dialogue community edited by Nick Patnam and Brian Martindale. And the last but not least, allow me to warmly thank you, our wonderful team who will hold this virtual space for us. As dialogical practitioners, we know how important it is to hold the space for conversation. 
And so let me thank the Exordo support team, especially Neris, the stage manager, Lorenzo, Melianna, Emma, and Enrico, the coordinator of the virtual team, Carol Madella, our web designer, Dario Valeri, thanks to him, the, 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 the space of our conference looks so nice. And the two angels of this conference, Francesca Camilli, who is really coordinate all the scientific part of the conference, and Tarek El Saiti for the research part. And now I'm very, very happy to introduce our sponsor, Open Excellence, Shana O'Callaghan, the CEO of the foundation. Hello, Raffaella. Thank you so much. And thank you for this really um, wonderful overview of this exciting conference. Um, I'm really happy to be here and that I can learn more about what's going on globally. And I'm very grateful to you for the work that you've done over these years to map the world of open dialogue, which really had not been done in a way that um, helped us understand its spread before. Uh, Open Excellence, also known as the Foundation for Excellence in Mental Health Care, is established and operates in order to support long-term research that otherwise would not be supported. This kind of research and this conference are critical to the work that we will do in the future to move beyond the current paradigm of psychiatry, which we all have seen fall apart a little bit in terms of its um, grounding. This work is important for the well-being of people, and I'm so grateful for all the participants who have submitted and who will present. Um, I'd like to encourage you to learn more about the Foundation for Excellence in Healthcare in Mental Health Care, Open Excellence. You can find us at openexcellence.org. You can learn how to support us, the kind of work that we're doing, and how to support this project, which we hope that you and the people you know um, will come together and do uh, in, in collaboration with our board and our advisory committee. So thank you very much. Thank you to the Board of Open Excellence for making this possible, especially including Ro and Sandy and Chris, who really helped to organize, um, and to Kermit. And thank you, Rafaela, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Shana. Thank you. And now I'm very happy to introduce you Ray Weddingham that has developed the, the guideline to help us to fully participate in this event despite the limitation of the uh, virtual space. Welcome, Ray. Thanks, Raffaella. Um, hello, everyone. It's lovely to know that you're out there. Um, obviously, as an online conference, the way in which we communicate here is different to being in a space together. Um, what we do have for you is a few different options. If you want to share your thoughts, your responses and your ideas, you can use the chat panel. So at the bottom right hand side of the screen, you should see a speech bubble. Click on that. It'll say chat. You can write your messages there. Um, make sure when you do this that if you want everyone to see it, please put send to everyone. If it's about a technical problem, we have the amazing stage managers. We've got Carol here. Send it to the host. But if it's a chat for everybody to see, make sure it's there for everyone. And I'll be in the chat room to help if needed. If you have a question that you'd like one of the panelists to address, um, look for the Q&A module. Um, Bottom right hand side, you might see a question mark or some dots. <laughs> Click on it, you should see Q&A. Play around, you won't break it. Um, type your question in and make sure you send it to all panelists so that we can actually see it. That would be wonderful. Um, just a few words about how we are together in this, in this space. Hopefully you've all had a look at the code of conduct. If you haven't, I'm going to type, put it in the chat later so you can have a look. Um, it's obviously really important to all of us that we create a space that is inclusive and, and kind of is about us creating this space for mutual learning. Um, whilst obviously the chairs and the chat moderators and the stage managers have particular responsibilities, 
this is a community of learning. So I'd love us to all take some agency in supporting one another. Feel free to critique ideas, to question things, to challenge things. This is polyphony, but please keep it respectful. And remember that people, all of the presenters and all of the other attendees are coming here with the best of intentions. If you have any issues, do get in touch with the chair, Raffaella, or myself or the stage manager, and we'll do our best to help you. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens over the next few days. Um, yeah, see you in the chat. Thanks, Raffaella. Thank you, Ray. Thank you very much. Yeah. Maybe we, we can uh, ask. So forgive me the privilege to, to introduce you, uh, our keynote speakers for today, Jacko Sekula and Tommy Bergstrom. Their presentation is dedicated to the memory of Birgitta Lacare, psychiatrist. You will also find a card that uh, Carlos Leon has developed uh, in the in the web uh, space to remember her with a link to her video. So welcome, Jacko and Tommy. Thank you. Thank you. We are with two minutes in advance, so but it's good not to be in delay. I think we were so afraid to delay that we are with two minutes in advance. And um, is it, yeah, is it so, the case that uh, Rafael? Is it the case that we go on with the same uh, module so that we do not need to close this and open up a new one for the keynote? No. No, it's the same. We we are um, on the same stage, so people can join this stage, and uh, it's actually live. So they will see it. Okay, I will be um, in in. Uh, I will be here, but I close my camera to give more space to your presentation, and I will direct to you the question uh, in about twenty minutes at the end of your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So, good day, or good morning, or good evening to everyone listening. So, our first presentation. I feel very honored to be the first one to speak and open up uh, this plenary okay. together with Tommy, Tommy Christian. And, uh, what is our plan is to start to say some words about our beloved uh, colleague, Birgitta Alakari, to her memory and after that to share our thoughts about the issue of making research in open dialogues. Uh, this is the third conference of uh, research in open dialogue. The first one was uh, taking place 2014. Already that one caused a lot of interest and we were very surprised about the interest of uh, combined research and uh, and uh, developing the clinical practice in open dialogue. I will, uh, um, I would like to say there are some words about our colleague Dr. Birgitta Alakari. Uh, when I was working in Lapland since early 80s until the end of 90s, so Birgitta was my colleague all the time there. And uh, and uh, during the year, she became the uh, doctor in charge of the psychiatric uh, system in the province of uh, Western Lapland. And uh, thereafter, I moved to university. We uh, continued with our col collaboration in many projects, especially in research. 
also speaking of the work, uh, work of Birgitta is also speaking of her interest to contribute research and its way to make the foundations of open dialogue in a very, very, very firm way. That was the interest that we started to share from the very beginning. And uh, Birgitta, as a psychiatrist, uh, was a, uh, her very humanistic way was uh, spread all over the practice. It was immediately met by the clients who needed help. And Birgitta, as we all had a strong interest all the time to work together with the families in any kind of situation. And for her, the interest of working with family seemed to be the primary one in her practice. In you know, the very big research of, uh, of uh, integrated treatment of acute psychosis, there was a question of if neurologic medication always is needed that much that it used to be used. And Birgitta became the clinician most responsible for developing the practice of, of uh, selective or need adaptive medication instead of automatic neurologic medication in psychosis crisis. This was combined as a research and uh, as a part of national research that we then continued in two inclusion periods as a local research. This was the main interest and uh, I think that for Birgitta also this made a kind of safe part to go into a, a new field of psychiatry that was very much against the mainstream proposal who proposed to strongly to use the neurologic medication in all the time. During the time Birgitta became uh, uh, the chief of the system and uh, her very bold way of uh, with all colleagues uh, regardless of the professional title, was very much liked, and people, people, people really, really took advantage because this meant that uh, in her way of, uh, in her way of uh, being, uh, being openly with all the question, he mobilized the best resources of the people who, who we were working. I was very happy to enjoy her work uh, all, all, also after her retiring from the position because until the very last years, even if during her illness, she was very keen to participate in the research and writing the reports of the, the, of, of, of the practice. So in that way, she was all the time very much updated and, and uh, was a very, a very strong support of the system. And uh, of course, this is a sad, very sad moment, losing her skills, losing her form, and losing her vision. But uh, we will, in our way, also to to honor her memory by by organizing the work in the way that we knew that it's very important to her. Uh, in in our speech. Uh, uh, it is our aim to, that uh, I will say some words in the beginning, or let's say a kind of historical background, right? what were the origins of, uh, of combining research in the open dialogue practice that was initially developed in the Western Lapland in Finland. And Tommy has been very strongly involved in the research uh, from a bit new perspective. And at uh, uh, the end of our part, we will. We will uh, show uh, those ideas that are valid and important issues for the research and developing the practice on the whole at the moment. Uh, the idea of research and open dialogue is a very specific one because uh, there, wouldn't, there wouldn't be open dialogue without research. And uh, we are used to think that research is something that is uh, run conducted by the academic institutions like the universities about the practice that the, that the clinics are, are, are doing in many ways. But this was not the case in open dialogue because when we opened the doors for the families and the patient to participate in the meetings since 1984, 14, 14 years ago, uh, we face very good outcomes, but at the same time started to have a, a quite confusing experiences that we did not expect it. 
and these confusing experiences put us the team who were working in a position that didn't understand more about the system because no textbooks, no guidelines of the treatment seem to uh, give uh, prerequisite to understand all the things that happens. And of course, when we were doing this very new practice of open therapy meetings, there was of, of course also a demand uh, to be secure that the uh, approach is valid for the problems. And in, that what started to happen. It's not uh, research here. It's not uh, done in a laboratory in which we make a design of the research and then try to measure what is the outcome of one method. But it's the opposite. We try to find ways to understand what happened in the practice. And in this way, the uh, uh, the emphasis is on a high external high external validity of the, of the research in the mostly in the laboratory based empiristic clinical trial they do not care of the external validity actually they say it openly that that is not so important issue but for for me or our practice it, it is the most important issue all the designs should be done according to the specific context and, and we need different methods, mixed methods of both quantitative, qualitative data in the same project, not as a separate way, but to make an intertwining of these ideas. Uh, you could, it is only a kind of a kind of very short sketch. To what, what, how can we do if we think that it is interactional therapies? Mean there are no manuals. How should you do your therapeutic actions? But you are working with your clients in the way that you. You seem to be best. You need to make some follow up of the outcome, some statistics. Second phase, you can choose uh, some specific cases, for instance, some extreme cases, uh, to make a comparison. Make a comparison in the, out of this uh, out of this group that we are comparing, and then you can make an integration of the results of the, of the cases in your statistical data. In this way, the external validity is guaranteed in the way that we know that we speak about the issues that happens in this treatment and with these clients and not only statistical numbers. And uh, uh, there are many elements, of course, that, that support this kind of way that actually has developed lately. In, in uh, the idea of research is uh, having a descriptive way of uh, seeing the practice, not finding explanation about that this is the variable that causes the change in the direction. For this reason, you need to uh, know a lot about what happens in the treatment. You can resist uh, the number of therapies, the hospitalization, use of medication, uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, all those issues, and they are a kind of uh, intermediate mediating variables, but they also say something about the outcomes, how many meetings with family we have compared to the other. We can look at the sessions, we can uh, look at every session to see if the process is going on well, and uh, then we can, it's very important to have uh, the follow up interviews systematically in the way that we invite the team who has been working with the family into the meetings. And in this way, start, we start to have an intervening process in which the research is all the time present in the practice. So that the practitioner do not need to wait five years to see the outcomes in the study reports, but they learn the outcome, uh, the experience of the clients immediately in the, in the interviews they are in, 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 in. Of course, there are challenges, how to make comparisons and how to, especially how to deal with unique treatment processes in analysis, because it's easy to make a kind of laboratory designs. There are many ways of doing comparison. The most valued is randomized clinical trial in, in which there is a control group from the same sample. The second way is to have a quasi-experimental design that is perhaps mostly used that we compared the team in, 
work in this scheme to some other be there can be done historical design what how was the situation before for instance open dialogue was done and how was it after the full minimum of the principles of open dialogue but a lot of the research has done as an internal comparison within the group and in this way we can have a very 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 important knowledge i give you three examples about it the first one is uh, at the very first to last study that we have 1988 until 1991 we will look in what happens on the boundary we had a term that we are looking at the system of boundary when one was uh, deferred to the hospitals we organized immediately a meeting and we started to see what happens on the meeting on the side of the client, the, her family, and on the side of the, of the clinics. And we found out uh, impo very important fac factors that in this open way of working, there are huge differences if, if the client is coming to the hospital for the first time. Almost everyone was able to come back to home and not to be hospitalized. Second group was people who really currently we, who, who had reoccurring crises and still were actively working. And the third one was the group of, uh, you know, you could say people who had been chronified in their problems and, uh, and uh, they really needed the, their uh, hospital as a part of the social network. We learned that the teamwork opens a broader social interest. And we learned the first, very first ideas on the importance of dialogue. And we learned that what we need to do, we, to not, to not try to force the family to accept the home treatment instead of hospitalization. The second example comes out of the many psychosis studies that we have had. The first one I already mentioned was uh, was uh, 92, 93 as a part of the Finnish national study in the creative treatment of acute uh, psychosis, and Birgit Alakari was really strongly involved, especially concerning the develop the new practice of using medication in psychotic crisis. We continued this uh, in, uh, in our own project, 94, 97, and then to check out uh, the outcomes, it was replicated at a bit more minor level 10 years after, and now Tommy has been very active to conduct this long-term outcome that we have. And, uh, uh, when the practice of open meetings was organized 84, in the many studies, we started to have uh, new experiences. And uh, in, a, in a research project, 94, 96, Professor Jukka Aaltonen, we made a, a, a content uh, analysis of the, of the patient records. Looking what happened with the patient, all the first time clients who come into the, into the, into the treatment in the area of Western Lapland during 10 years time. And uh, we find out, found out that the incidence of schizophrenia has declined during the new way 85, 94, and actually had, had declined also thereafter until the 2005, very dramatically. Actually it's 95% person, person. and as an outcome of this uh, content analysis by reading the 150 first time psychotic patient reports, we came out with the description of the main principles of open dialogue. And this is what I mean, the description of the system, not an explanation. We know that these are the ideas on which we organize the system, and then we can see what happens in the outcome. And uh, here is one example <coughs> about, uh, about these uh, studies. And it was when combining the first inclusion periods. And uh, this is an example of the, of the, of uh, making internal comparison, finding out what are the poor outcome and good outcome. We found out 61 good outcome patients and uh, 17 poor outcome patients. And then we, when we look what happened in the treatment, we found out that uh, those who had poor outcome, they were more hospitalized. They use neuroleptics uh, much more compared to the good outcome situation. 
uh, uh, board outcome situation, they had a very poor social network and there did not happen any change during the process. Whereas in good outcome, they already had quite adequate social network. And, uh, and if not, there happened a development in, in, this, in this system. So that making this kind of uh, this kind of comparison in between the group without the need of having comparison to any other, we actually find out the very relevant uh, elements to develop the practice. We try to avoid the hospitalization, unnecessary hospitalization. We try to be very selective to avoid unnecessary use of neurological communication. Having the focus of some social network is very important, the most important issue of the of the whole and actually referring again to our uh, colleague Birgitta Alakert, this was her main interest always to make a connection collaboration with the family as the first step to have a productive way of working. And then continuing this, I made a research about selecting cases from these two, two groups, good outcomes and poor outcomes, and analyze the dialogues what happened in the meeting, because all the meetings are always video recorded. We found out that in good outcome situations, people had a lot of dominance. They took a lot of initiatives about the style of speaking. There were a lot of uh, reflective, uh, symbolic reflective reflections, where in poor outcome situations, the, the dialogue was mainly speaking about the issues of treatment and natural much issues of life. And there were a lot of uh, lot of uh, dialogical sequences. This focusing on dialogues has been has been uh, uh, an issue in many research thereafter. Psychologist Kauko Harakan has made the research voices of the treatment meeting. That was very important research to look to find out the core element of the of the dialogue. I suppose that um, in many parts of all issues that I teach, for instance, in, in, in training programs about dialogue, dialogue, dialogues comes out of the uh, dissertation that Kauko made, coming into the, into the relational mind in which we have been looking about the issues, what happens in our bodies in the, in the, in the dialogue. In this way, the, the results of the, of the groups combined to the results of the single cases and situations and combined the new idea, how do we come to be a part of the dialogue, not only speaking, but our bodily presence is uh, very relevant. And the third example comes out of the one of quasi-experimental trial. There is a, this is very strange idea because many reviews about the open dialogue research, they say that there are not a, clinical trials, but this is not true. And, and, and for some reason, they do not uh, refer in this, for instance, the last, last review of, of uh, uh, I forgot the name of the author that published 2018, 2019. They said that there are not clinical trials. And when I look at the list of the research, they did not include this research in which we actually made a quasi-experimental trial to find out what are the uh, results of uh, of Western Lapland uh, in, in the period of national research, in the period of local open dialogue research, to a comparison to, from other treatment as usual uh, uh, center. And we found a lot of uh, big uh, differences, huge difference in the, in the hospitalization, huge difference in the, in the number of family meetings you can make a Propose a hypothesis that actively working with family is a very important step. Step there are a lot more relapses in in the comparison group compared to the compared to the uh, open dialogue team. The employment stage status was totally different. That also become evident in the long term uh, follow up. As we can see here. Uh, more than a half uh, living on a disability allowance already in two years' time about the schizophrenia patient compared to only 
or, or, or more certain versions in the, in the open dialogue group. And there were also the significant difference comparing to the, the situation for the chimp. Okay, uh, these are three very short examples about uh, the issues, how to, how to uh, uh, about issues, how to intertwine, how to make a process in which we intertwine the develop in the clinical practice and and research, and having an interest on research about uh, what are the core elements in the treatment itself and how do they affect the outcomes, and we can do a comparison to finding outcomes that are not so good and compare them to outcomes that are better and have a conclusion about that. And those are very relevant. This is what we mean when we speak about ex high external validity. All the outcomes, even if we do not have a comparison group, are very valid to develop the practice. But now I give the floor to Tommy, who, who can come in the field of making research of open dialogue from a new point of view. Let me please say when I need to change the slide. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Jakko. Do you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So my name is Tommy and I am present psychologist of Keropuras Hospital. And alongside my clinical work, I am also conducting research in the University of Hyväskylä, as Jakko said. But before I tell you more about my research and research about open dialogue, I'd like to say something about myself and how I relate to this whole story. First of all, I'm not originally from Western Lapland, but instead I'm from Helsinki. Uh, and actually, I haven't even heard about Western Lapland before I moved here, but I had heard about Keropudas Hospital. Uh, as I was still an undergraduate student in psychology, I heard about those uh, research and also the promising treatment outcomes that Iako mentioned, and they got my attention because, as we know, they contradict with many things that is currently thought about mental health problems, and yet they still somehow made sense for me, at least uh, on the basis of my personal life history, and it was also very interesting because uh, for some reason, uh, some Finnish mental health professionals seem to be almost hostile against this approach. Uh, it was sometimes viewed uh, some kind of a strange way of working that was practiced somewhere far away from real civilization. Uh, that was kind of a art. So, of course, I have to see it all by myself. So I moved to Tornio and I started to work as a psychologist in Keropuras Hospital. The year was 2014. First thing I noticed was that there were more variation in actual treatment as compared to these reports from 80s and 90s. Basically, many staff members who were used to working in this more dialogical way and who were developing the services and doing research, they were already retired. Uh, and there were also some challenges to arrange this, um, uh, this uh, open dialogue on the job training program in the Western Lapland, mainly because of the significant changes in Finnish psychotherapist training system. Over the years, there had also been many different kind of political decisions affecting the entire Finnish healthcare services. Uh, and as a result, for example, in some, some towns, the services are bought from larger cities and from private companies. And this meant also very conventional treatment. So there were no longer this uh, dialogical treatment system that systematically covered entire region, as it did at the time of the development of the approach and when Jaco and his co-workers developing the services in the area. But anyway, something was still left, and I think this something was enough to show me these mental health problems in a very different uh, manner and uh, in different way than what my earlier clinical experience and textbooks have taught me about them. Uh, instead of some kind of mystic medical conditions, there's, there often seems to be 
just people who have suffered from a wide variety of different kind of challenges in their lives and whose experiences and problems were also quite understandable when you think about their life history and context. And in this context, the way how these difficulties were addressed in this more need adapted and dialogical way, it just made sense. Uh, and it also seems to be working, especially as I have this opportunity to compare different kind of uh, treatment methods and approaches in my everyday work. So all of this increased my curiosity towards this whole topic, and I wanted to learn more. And one day I found this very small piece of paper from my office that I actually had inherited from former head psychologist Markus Sutela. And in this paper, they described this initial idea of long-term follow-up. The idea was to use these national electronic health care registers to see how people who participated to those original open dialogue studies have actually survived and how they are doing in present day. But unfortunately, Marku passed away before they were able to move on with this idea. Uh, then I met with Jaakko and I told him about this idea, if I could dig around a little bit their old materials and to see how people were actually doing nowadays. And to be honest, I was a little surprised when Jaakko basically pushed his life work for me and just said that it's about time that somebody do the work. Uh, so I started to track down those cohort members uh, together with Birgitta actually. And me and Birgitta, we became very good friends during this project. Uh, and it was great honor and opportunity for me that I got this opportunity to work with her in this uh, research. But anyway, this is how it began. And now, Jaakko, if you now could change next slide, please. Okay, thanks. So the main goal of this long-term uh, follow-up study was to study how these people who participated to, to those original open dialogue studies uh, that Jaakko mentioned have survived over a longer term. Um, basically, the sample includes all first episode psychosis uh, that uh, was uh, emerging in the services during that time period. Uh, and we observed mortality and the use of mental health and social services on approximately this 19 year follow up period. And main outcomes were compared with comparison group that included people who received treatment uh, for first episode psychosis outside of Western Lapland region. Uh, overall, these Finnish registers have quite uh, high quality and accuracy, and they also enable the, this kind of a formation large and kind of uh, representative samples. Uh, here's some backgrounds of this sample. Uh, and next slide, Jakko. And here are the main findings from this study. So basically, it seems that this, uh, this good outcomes uh, had sustained after a longer period of time. And after adjustment for potential co-founders, uh, including age, gender diagnosis, and follow-up time, the treatment commenced outside of Western Lapland area associated with higher probability of still being in treatment and on disability allowances at the end of the 19-year follow-up. Uh, overall, this in this resistor-based study, there was indication that OD associated with better outcome as compared to this standard care. But of course, uh, as Jaakko mentioned, also this kind of study, this is mainly observational study and there's several limitations. Uh, most importantly, in this kind of register study, uh, it, this it doesn't tell us much about how people are actually doing and what they really think about their treatment uh, and what are their personal experiences about all of this. So together with Birgitta, we started to approach these uh, cohort members via letters. And in these letters, we thought that we are interested to hear what are their own thoughts about mental health treatment in Western Lapland. And we also wanted to hear their own perspective, why they had used mental health services in the first place. Uh, 20 people respond, which I personally think is quite good ratio when you think about context. 
and the fact that some of them didn't have any mental health services in years. Uh, and we met all of them and we asked them to share their life stories as precisely as they could. Uh, next slide. Uh, results were also very interesting and also quite challenging from a researcher perspective because people actually didn't talk much about treatment. Uh, instead, the factors that help them to survive or manage in this uh, difficult and challenging life situation that was named uh, psychosis, uh, they were found outside of mental health care. Uh, from relationships, uh, from changes in major life area, uh, from own actions and from things like that. And this was clearly reflecting their tendency to associate this challenging experience with actual life events. Basically, in many stories, different life challenges and disappointments accumulated. Uh, people couldn't sleep or think clearly. And finally, someone defined the situation with the term psychosis. Sure, people thought also something about the treatment and we also asked more specific questions about it and actually we are currently trying to get these first person accounts published. So before that we could not say much about uh, results but in a general level the experiences of open dialogue treatment itself were very neutral or positive. Anyway, for young psychologists from kind of a conventional clinical and academic world, these results seem to be kind of paradoxical at first, because certain kind of way of working and arranging services seems to be associated with kind of a good outcome, but people themselves did not emphasize this treatment. Next slide. Um, but then I understood that maybe this is it. And in my dissertation that was actually published in last year, I looked these results side by side and created this kind of uh, hypothesis that maybe this more dialogical way to address difficult life situation could support people, agency and personal meaning making process. And this is also something that we see also in resistors and in good social functioning and in things like that. And I want to underline that this is hypothesis uh, and I, because I think it's very important that we constantly critically test this kind of assumption and evaluate our doings with research. Uh, because maybe these treatment outcomes that has been reported from Western Lapland are not only describing how this specific uh, psychotherapy method or program improves the outcomes of mental health treatment. Uh, maybe they demonstrate how we can improve our services with this systematic uh, naturalistic research integrated with everyday clinical practice uh, that invites people from the service users, social networks and also uh, grassroots level mental health workers together to think what is actually helping at individual level, uh, what are the main challenges in local services and how services truly address actual needs of service users and their family members and uh, other and other social networks in this specific context. Uh, next slide. So I'm glad that in Western Lapland we have uh, once again started naturalistic <coughs> research programs. A couple of years ago, we started to arrange these kind of um, open meetings for all staff members and uh, also peer experts, uh, where we planned how we can start to do this thing. And based on these meetings, we started a very comprehensive research uh, project that aims to survey current services. At the same time, we are going to produce also long term outcome data from different kind of treatment uh, practice and approaches. Uh, and I'm also very glad that the University of Yvaskula is once again covering our back in this. And it's also good that Hannele Mäki Tervo, who is a peer expert from Western Lapland, uh, she started to work as a co-researcher in this project. And she's actually doing her doctoral thesis now in this project, which is also great. Um, what we are going to do, uh, basically, in next year, we are going to ask uh, people own perspective why mental health services are used in that uh, specific situation. 
and what has been or could be helping in their mental health care. At the first pace, we are going to use this very simple questionnaire, which basically lists all available services, uh, methods and ways of working that currently exist in Western Lapland mental health services, including also many open-ended questions. Uh, and we hope that this way of doing research will allow us to understand what the current treatment actually is in Western Lapland. And at the same time, we gain information on how people are actually interpreting different kind of situations, uh, how different perspectives and backgrounds are associating with treatment and outcomes and things like that. Uh, but most importantly, this way of doing research allows everyone to participate in this joint process to produce information. And this information is then directly available to all people in the treatment process. So we hope that this project will act this kind of a platform that enable different kind of research, including also collaboration with Hope and Dialogue project. Uh, in other words, we are trying to get whole community to participate to this more to think more systematically how we can help each other in the different kind of situations. Uh, because I honestly and personally think that mental health services are developing only in this uh, kind of um, dialogical research process. Okay, so that was my part. That's what there was a little uh, history, uh, present and future of open dialogue research in Western Lapland. Uh, and you may, may have some questions. I haven't checked chat box yet, but uh, maybe Jakko would like to say something that will summarize this whole thing. Uh, no, perhaps I only added some points about but these points we already have been speaking. So about this importance of intertwining research and clinical practice to follow what happens in the real work in the real world. And in this way, we really would have guaranteed the high external validity of the of the studies. For instance, one uh, outcome is that we repeated the psychosis uh, uh, research in three inclusion periods and all the inclusion periods uh, the question of the outcomes were pretty much the same and i have not seen any other studies in which they could have repeated that, uh, that three times the same outcomes there is no loss of the significance when, when it put into practice because it, it, it research in the practice in laboratory design they say that 20 percent uh, decreased the uh, efficacy when it's put into practice, but in our studies, this has not been done, but we can be pretty sure that the statistics really, really uh, describe the situation. Uh, yeah, now I need to stop sharing so that we can be visible here. If there are, I don't know how, if there are some questions or comments, Rafael, are you perhaps have got some? I think your mic is off, Rafaela. So I need to I need to change your to Rafaela now. Now do you hear me? Yeah. Now, sorry, it was my fault that I did not. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, I just want to say that thank you very much for your presentation. We have just uh, finished our time together. Unfortunately, the the Quindy session was very quiet, and this is why I didn't interrupt your presentation. And uh, so, thank you very much. I, I, I would have a small question, but uh, uh, we will would have not more than five minutes to to reply, not to go to to to. To take too much time for the break that are also very important in such a digital event. And my question would be, what are your wishes for uh, future research about open dialogue in the world? Uh, my wish would be that people become encouraged to include evaluating their own practice. And I, I think that we found uh, quite a good way that fit in uh, in uh, Western Lapland, but I don't know if, if, if 
some of those ideas can be used in different settings. Yeah, I would like to respond to something similar because I'd also like to see kind of a, a grassroots level research that shapes the services and more kind of a creativity, how do you say it, more creativity to this research process uh, and also more encouragement to different kind of views and experiences and methods and things like that to see what is actually working in that specific location and culture and yeah that's what i wish to see thank and you and I really look don't be afraid of numbers statistics they are not yeah. yeah we are actually also i didn't mention it but we are also co continuing this register-based outcome evaluation and we are going to soon publish some interesting findings from it as well but yeah something to look forward also yeah thank you very much and i also look thank forward you. for for our collaboration and uh, it's clear also from the survey results that uh, open dialogue in west lapland is really a standard that we are aiming for but we are far away in many countries for that standard so i think all the research you are doing can help the other countries to understand how to arrive to that standard so I think our time for the first uh, session is finished. Thank you very much to both of you.